Hey guys, welcome back yet again to another episode of the show where I find some of the worst reviewed movies of all time and take a look at what went wrong. Back in the 1980s, there was this movie that came out called Highlander. It starred Christopher Lambert, who some of you may recognize as Raiden from the first Mortal Kombat movie, and Sean Connery. Now, I think Highlander is a pretty cool movie. I mean, it's not perfect by any means, but I think it's got a really cool story. I think it's well directed, and it's different. I really like that about it. You could make the argument that the sequel is different as well, and it is. It is very different. However, the sequel's different more... It's not different in the good way. It's more different in a way that makes you go... Wait, what? Why? Why would you... What? Highlander is centered around Connor McCloud, a Scotsman living back in the 1500s, who finds out from the character Ramirez that he is actually an immortal being. Ramirez trains McCloud in combat and reveals to him that the only way he can die is by decapitation, and that there are other immortals who will all fight each other until only one remains. The movie primarily takes place in 1985, but jumps back and forth to different time periods, showing Connor's progression until the movie reaches its conclusion when Connor is tasked to fight the strongest and only other remaining immortal. Now, Highlander really wasn't that successful when it was first released, but eventually it went on to become a cult film and drew quite a fan base. There was a Highlander TV series and a bunch of sequels, the first of which is what this episode is all about. Highlander 2 is a weird movie, and coming from me, that means it's really weird, because, like, just look at this show, and, and look, at the, look at the stuff I've been spending my spare time watching for the past seven years. Like, weird has become my new normal. I've, I've accepted that. Just look at the first Highlander movie, sword fight between two immortals in a parking lot after a wrestling match. I, I didn't even blink an eye at that. That was cool as shit, actually. But this, I, I don't even really know what this is. It's, and I know I've said this so many times on this show, it feels like a bunch of different things and ideas just mashed together. It, this movie, I'm, I'm dead serious, it really feels like that. You know when you were a kid, and do you remember, <laughs> I can remember being a kid and playing with like markers, like Crayola markers, and you know, you'd combine two of the colors to create different colors, and I was like, oh, this is cool. And then at one point you have the idea, what if I combine all of the markers in the box? And it just becomes this shitty brown color. That's what this is. That's that's really what this movie this movie is the the shitty brown uh, combination of things. I also have to mention that there are multiple versions of this film. So apparently during principal photography the production went broke and that led to the bonding company which ensured the production to come in and just take over the film and, and take over editing and that's what led to the horrible theatrical release. Since then there have been uh, several re-edits done for the subsequent releases for the film like the DVD release, Blu-ray release, might have been something done for the European release, uh, but in these re-edits the filmmakers tried to correct the things that audiences hated, and I gotta say, a lot of this stuff, you know, it's like putting lipstick on a pig, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, you did that, but still a pig. The original theatrical release is actually really hard to find because the DVD and Blu-ray releases are all the recut versions of the film. So if you want to find that original theatrical version, you have to track down the, the VHS or Laserdisc copy of the film. And I haven't been able to find a rip of either of those online. I did find certain scenes, uh, which I'm going to use in this review. But uh, for this review, I'm going to be doing the, the Blu-ray copy, which is, you know, the, the re-edit of the film, but don't worry because, like, there's, there's enough here, put it that way. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not short on stuff to talk about. The movie starts in the year 2024, where Earth no longer has any ozone layer, so a giant shield now protects the planet. Since McCloud won the Battle of the Immortals in the first movie, he became mortal and could read people's thoughts. Now because he became mortal again, he was able to grow old, which is why at the beginning of the movie, he's shown as an old man. And this is where the movie already just takes a dive off the deep end and insults 
not only fans of the original movie, but anybody who remembers what happened in the original movie. The movie starts intercutting between McLeod at the opera and memories of his past, which make no sense. So 500 years ago, there was a rebellion against a general named Katana somewhere on Earth, somewhere with very advanced weaponry, because judging by pictures of guns from the 16th century, I'm guessing no other civilization got the memo on how to make an assault rifle five centuries ago. And not only were McLeod and Ramirez part of this rebellion, but Ramirez actually picks McLeod out of the group for being a man of great destiny, and even creates some kind of special bond with him. After the fall of the rebels, Katana captures McLeod and Ramirez, and the priests of the planet have them exiled into the future to compete in the Battle of the Immortals, the winner of which will get to choose to either grow old and die in the future, or return back with his freedom and faith restored. Which, of course, would lead into the events of the first movie. Now, the original version of the movie was a little bit different. The rebellion didn't take place on Earth 500 years ago. It took place on a different planet, the planet of Zeist. McLeod and Ramirez aren't exiled into the future, they're exiled to the planet Earth to compete in the Battle of the Immortals. Leaders of the rebellion, you've been found guilty of treason. We hereby sentence you to exile from Zeist. You will be sent to the planet Earth. Once there, you will be immortal. You can only die if your head is cut from your body. When one of you becomes the last of us on Earth, priests, he will claim the prize. He can return to Zeist or choose to grow old and die on Earth. Fans of the movie were understandably kind of pissed off with the notion that McLeod and Ramirez were aliens from a different planet. However, the funny thing is, the re-edited version of the movie, which takes out all references to the planet Zeist, and instead replaces it with them you know, being from Earth and being exiled into the future, I would argue doesn't make any more sense. In fact, I, I think it actually makes less sense. Therefore, I sentence you both to this same exile. An exile into the future. What? Silence, General Katana. In that distant future, you will face other immortals in trial by combat, from which only one can survive. Finally, the last one to survive will have a choice. Choice what choice? Grow old and die in the future, or return here with his freedom and faith restored. As an audience, we're being told that McLeod and Ramirez knew each other and even shared a special bond with each other in the events that took place before the first movie, even though in the first movie, Connor McLeod has no idea who Ramirez is. This was kind of a big part of the first movie and Connor McLeod's development as a character, the training by Ramirez, where he also teaches Connor about his own immortality and the battle that is about to occur amongst the immortals. So if we accept Highlander 2's assertion that Connor McLeod obviously already knew all of these things beforehand, then I guess we're just supposed to assume that, what, he just forgot all of these things at some point? Oh, okay, yeah, I'm starting to remember now. It's, yeah, it's, it's coming back. You're, you're, you're that guy who, you picked me out of a crowd of people and said I was a man of great destiny, and then we had some kind of special bonding thing where we dipped our fingers in some kind of quickening juice, and then there was all this electricity and lightning, and then you wrote some shit on my forehead, and then we had a battle with the, uh, with the rebels, and then we lost, and then we were exiled into the future to battle it out with a bunch of other exiled immortals. Oh, yeah! Okay, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I gotta start writing this stuff down. Now, apparently, in the original script, this was explained by Ramirez and McLeod being reborn on planet Earth and not having any memory of their past until it was time for the tournament. However, this doesn't make sense either because at no point in the original movie does McLeod remember this stuff. Anyways, back in the past, Katana and the priests are watching a live stream of McLeod as an old man. And then the priests start talking about how McLeod still hasn't made his choice yet and that he can still come back from the future. Okay, so I think it was made pretty clear at the end of the first movie that McLeod made the choice to stay with Brenda, have children, and use his gift of reading people's minds to make the world a better place. Why, why would he go back in time now? To fight this douche? Or maybe it's because in the original cut, 
Katana overheard McCloud saying this. If I win the prize, I'll be back. Anyways, there are groups of people who think the Ozone Shield is no longer needed and that the Shield Corporation just wants to keep it running for profit, so they're trying to take it down. One of these groups is run by the character Louise, who at one point finds a note in her bag telling her to meet McCloud at a bar, which is very strange. I mean, it's never explained how the note got in there or how, or how anyone knew where McCloud would be. You might think that maybe McCloud wanted to get this information to her, you know, but that doesn't make any sense either because when she gets to the bar, he wants nothing to do with her. I'm Louise Marcus. Terror is a dangerous business, Miss Marcus. I'm not a terrorist. Well, whatever you are, Miss Marcus, you'll have to excuse me. I had some very disturbing news. Did somebody die? Unfortunately not. Goodbye, Miss Marcus. For some reason, I guess McCloud has become immortal again. He finds this out when his hand is cut and it heals instantly. Why is he immortal again? I don't know, he just is. I guess the entire plot of the first movie is now meaningless. So Katana sends some assassins into the future to kill McCloud because he's worried that McCloud is gonna come back. Why is he so worried about that? He kicked McCloud's ass the first time, so who cares? Why don't you just go into the future and kill him? Why send these dipshits? Anyways, the assassins show up and stop them, and McCloud tells Louise to hide in the dumpster and not to make a sound. But the assassins are right there. They can see you. I mean, what's the point of hiding if the people that you're hiding from can see where you're hiding? Anyways, these guys are kind of like an insanely annoying version of the twins from The Matrix Reloaded. So after one assassin gets his head cut off, McCloud is hit with the quickening and turns into younger McCloud. I would say it made him immortal again, but as I mentioned earlier, it appears like he became immortal again before this. Anyways, after he cuts the head off the other assassin, he and Louise decide to start make it out for some reason. I really don't understand why the movie tries to make this some intensely romantic moment. I mean, they don't, they don't even know each other. They, there was no build up to this at all. They met, he told her to get lost. She spent a few seconds driving with him. He comes out of an explosion looking 30 years younger and suddenly it's dry hump city. The next scene is hilarious because Louise tries to make sense of everything. And it basically just proves that changing the story from McCloud being from a different planet to being from a different time period just adds confusion because she's talking about him within the context of being from a different planet. So it just sounds weird. Okay, now let me just see if I can get this straight. You're mortal there, but you're immortal here until you kill all the guys from there who have come here, and then you're mortal here. Unless you go back there, or some more guys from there come here, in which case you become immortal here, again. Something like that. Now even though Ramirez was killed in the first movie, he's suddenly brought back to life thanks to a very convenient piece of writing. But we are joined in a way that can never be broken. Not even by death. When you need me, you'll only have to call my name. Ramirez, my old friend Ramirez! Katana goes into the future to kill McCloud himself, and McCloud at one point just goes to his hideout. I'm not sure how he knew where to find him. New York is kind of a big city. Ramirez and McCloud decide to help Louise take down the shield, so they drive to a prison to talk to the guy who helped McCloud build the shield 25 years ago. And I love how there's no gate or anything. They're able to pretty much just drive right in. At one point, they reach a bunch of armed guards who just completely spray the car with bullets. Louise was hiding in the trunk, and I have to say, this was an incredibly dangerous plan. Sure, Ramirez and McCloud are immortal, but Louise isn't. And I think in a situation like this, there's a pretty good chance of one of those bullets finding its way into the trunk. Just hide in the trunk, hun. Just hide in the trunk. Yes, there's a good chance we're just gonna get completely turned into Swiss cheese, but hopefully you'll be okay back there. You know, just just curl up in a ball and uh, maybe we'll get lucky. 
Anyways, Ramirez uses some kind of immortal magic to stop some fan blades, which kills him. And Louise and McLeod drive to an area where there's some kind of hole in the shield, so they <laughs> so they climb up a mountain so they can see over the shield. And I don't see what the point of this is. Is this is this to see if the shield is still necessary? Like if the ozone layer has repaired itself? Yes, I guess nothing beats the old eye test. Everything looks nice up here, so I'm gonna guess that the ozone layer is all good. So they go to the shield generator, and even with all these security guards, I guess they're able to just walk in. During the final fight, McCloud somehow just has his original katana back. Like, there he is with his original sword from the first movie. Where did this come from? It never appeared throughout the movie, and suddenly he just has it. <laughs> the funny thing is, is, something like this seems pretty small compared to all the other things wrong with the movie. <laughs> the The idea of his item, like his sword, just coming out of nowhere is minuscule when compared to everything else in the movie that doesn't make sense. McCloud cuts off General Katana's head, walks into the, I don't know, I'm just gonna keep calling this the shield generator, and this destroys the shield. Now, the movie ends with McCloud and Louise outside kissing, cut to a shot of the earth, pan up to the stars, roll credits. The end, right? However, in one of the other versions of the film, there's a different ending, which is called the fairy tale ending. And this ending consists of McCloud taking Louise back to his home planet. And I'm just gonna roll the whole thing for you right now because it's it's pretty funny. Will you show me your home? Can you see it from here? See that little star next to the moon? That's where I'm going. <laughs> Come with me. I can't, and you know it. Sure you can. Well, how? It's a can of magic. Come on. We can do it. Remember, Highlander, you've both still got your full measure of life. Use it well, and your future will be glorious. To be quite honest, the decision to go back and recut the film and remove any reference to them being from a different planet, you know, it, it really doesn't change all of that much, you know, in my opinion. It, it doesn't, doesn't make the movie substantially better. It's like maybe 1% better, but then it adds in its, its own slew of problems, as I outlined before. I know there were other changes made, uh, and to fully grasp that, you'd have to watch the original theatrical version, but I mean, if this version is the better version, then I can only imagine what it was like to watch the original cut in the theater when it came out. To be fair, as bad as this movie is, I've definitely seen worse on this show, but this is definitely one of the worst sequels I've ever seen. The, the irony here, of course, is that one of the, like the tagline throughout the Highlander series is, there can only be one. And after watching this sequel, maybe there should have only been one. Hey, as usual, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, my next review, I'm going to be doing Manos, The Hands of Fate. Uh, that's a review that I've put off for years and I finally dug into. So I'm writing that right now and uh, that should be the next video coming up soon. So once again, thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.